respected scholars, elders, brothers and sisters in Islam, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. There was a great sign in the heavens. The woman who was clothed under the sun, and she had 12 stars that were on her head. She was pregnant, and she was just about to give birth. She cried out with pain. And at that moment, the universe witnessed another sign from the heavens. A devil who emerged with seven heads, ten horns, and seven crowns, tried to devour the child, tried to take the child away from this lady. This male child, who would eventually become the ruler of all nations, was immediately taken up by God towards the throne. This is an extract from the Gospel of John, Book of Revelation. And it is in reference to an individual who is deemed to be the savior of mankind. An individual who according to Islamic teachings is the light of Allah on this earth. A man who is his representative, a human being who benefits others whilst people do not see him just like the sun is benefiting the earth while being behind the cloud. An individual who is the divine link, a man whom the Prophet of Allah says he is the peacock for the people of paradise. He is none other than Sayyidina wa Mawlana, Sahib al Asri wa Zaman, Al Imam al Mahdi al Qa'im. The Holy Prophet of Islam says if you want to know al Mahdi, he is a man who for the people of paradise, he is a joy to look at. When we look at the peacock, a peacock is a symbol of beauty. The narration tells us that on the day of judgment in Jannah, despite all the magnificent favors and the blessings of Allah, there is something that stands out that catches the attention of people. Just like how a peacock will draw people's eyes towards it. The Prophet of Allah says, this is my Mahdi and your Mahdi and is the savior for mankind who will draw people because he is the manifestation of Allah's beauty on this earth. When we look at this in individual and when we analyze the narrations that exist about him and about his role, we come across a famous narration from the Prophet of Allah, Muhammad al Mustafa, sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. The Prophet is telling you and I about the best action that we can do whilst we are in the process of awaiting the Holy Imam. Afdalu a'malu ummati intivarul faraj. The best thing that people can do is to wait. Question. Many people look at this particular narration that is shared across all Muslim backgrounds and denominations and sects and they ponder, what does it actually mean? The Prophet of Allah says in this process of awakening a man who is in an occultation, who is the savior, whom all monotheistic religions and other groups are waiting for this Messiah to bring justice and equity and to spread this form of peace around the world. What is it that we and I should be doing as far as waiting? The Prophet of Allah says, this is the best action that you and I can do. Of course, normally we are told there's two types of intivar. One is passive and one is active. And you and I are always told that this passive waiting is not what we are seeking, is not what the Prophet of Allah is talking about, is the active anticipation and expectation, meaning that when you and I anticipate a guest to our house and we know that they'll be coming soon, we prepare the house, we prepare the food, we dress accordingly, we are in complete anticipation for the arrival of the guest, not that when they knock the door we start preparing the grounds for their visitation. When it comes to this particular element of intivar, there is a journey that you and I seek 
a need to undertake. This process of expecting the arrival of the Imam, very briefly in the next few minutes, I wish to take you to a journey in order to understand how do we prepare ourselves as individuals and collectively as a community for the eventual reappearance of the Holy Twelfth Imam. And today, many people across the world, especially the scholars from the school of Ahl al-Bayt, tell you that the time is very near. The time is indeed close, especially in 2012, with all the events that we have witnessed. An individual today stands closer, insha'Allah ta'ala, and Allah knows best. But when it comes to preparation, we need to understand two important elements. The first is individual preparation and awaiting. Al-intidhar al-fardi, meaning what? You and I, as human beings who seek and yearn to be of the followers of Al-Mahdi, the awaited Savior, what do we do individually? How do we progress as a human being? Well, there are a number of recommendations, a number of etiquettes for the human being that is considered a muntadar, a one, an individual who waits. Number one, ma'rifah of the Imam. To have cognizance, understanding, knowledge of who he is. You and I should be waking up in the morning and reciting the following dua. Allahumma arrifni nafsak. Oh Allah, give me ma'rifah. Not just knowledge. Ma'rifah is knowledge coupled and intertwined with action. Oh Allah, let me, allow me to have ma'rifah, deep recognition of who you are. فَإِن لَمْ تُعَرِّفْنِي نَفْسَكْ لَمْ أَعْرُفْ رَسُولَكْ If you do not do so, I will have no idea who your prophet is. اللهم عَرِّفْنِي رَسُولَكْ Oh Allah, let me understand who your prophet is. فَإِن لَمْ تُعَرِّفْنِي رَسُولَكْ لَمْ أَعْرُفْ حُجَّتَكْ Without this, without the recognition of the Prophet, then I will not be able to understand and have cognizance of who your hujjah, your proof on this earth is. Allahumma, and this is the catch point. This is the bombshell for those who do not care about Al-Mahdi, who go about in their normal daily lives without reflecting and pondering what their responsibility and their connection and relationship with the Imam of the time is. Understand this particular narration and this particular supplication, which says, Allahumma arrifni hujjatak. Oh Allah, give me and bestow upon me the favor of understanding who your hujjah is. Why? Without the ma'rifah of the imam, I have gone astray. There is no standing on the right path when it comes to the religion. We all know that the imam is here. We cannot see him. Yet he sees us. Sometimes he interacts with us and we do not know. Just like what happened in Bahrain. Today, in this country that is fighting for human rights and civil liberties. Today, this country that is demanding and the people are calling for their basic rights of freedom and democracy. Back in the time during the British rule, there was a ruler who despised the followers of Ali ibn Abi Talib. One day, one of his ministers came to him and said, I have the best proof to go to these individuals, the followers of the Ahl al-Bayt, and to present them with proof that their sect is wrong. He said, tell me, what is it? He said, look at this pomegranate. He opened it, and on the pomegranate it says, Muhammadun Rasulullah. Muhammad is the messenger of Allah. And then it is inscribed that after him there are four khalifs. The first, second, third, and Ali ibn Abi Talib. He says, look at this. This is found in the pomegranate. We cannot have carved this. Surely this is a sign for whom? For people to follow or to leave the school of Ahl al-Bayt. This particular ruler brought out the heads of the Shia. This is a famous story in Bahrain. If you were to go today to Bahrain, they'll tell you about it. He brought the, the followers of the, of the uh, school of Ahl al-Bayt and he said to them, look, this is the proof. Now, you either leave your faith or you pay the jizya. In other words, we will treat you as non-Muslims. They levied tax upon you. You have a choice. They said, give us three days. They went, they were all anxious. They were all stressful, not knowing what to do. At that moment, they decided that on three consecutive days, they'll send the best three, the most noble three individuals to go and pray to Allah for inspiration in the hope that they get light from the light of Imam Zaman. Eventually the third individual, the narrations tell us he went barefooted and bareheaded. He went to the desert, he prayed, and whilst he was weeping, somebody came to him and said, what's your problem? He said to him, this is my problem. This individual said to him, your problem is solved. Tomorrow, go to the 
palace and demand to go to the room that belongs to the minister. When you go to the room on your left hand side, you'll find a pouch, a small bag. Take out this bag and they'll find a pomegranate. Crush the pomegranate and you'll see powder emerging from it. That will be a sign from Allah that this claim is indeed false. He said, as soon as I lifted my head, he was not there to be seen. I went back. I was joyful. I knew that this was the Imam of my time. He had come to my aid and the aid of my community. I went to the king or to the ruler. I said to him, these are my conditions. If you want us to rebuttal, we went to the room despite the resistance that they showed that they did not want us to go we went exactly where the imam had said i opened up and it turned out that there was a mold made out of clay that the particular minister had used and he had put this mold around the tree in order for the pomegranate to grow with this particular inscription in order to deceive people he says as soon as i took it and I crushed it, the powder emerged, which showed the deception. The ruler looked at the minister and said, this is how you deceive me. The man is called Muhammad ibn Isa. Today there is a mosque named after him, Muhammad ibn Isa. And eventually the minister was executed and the ruler became a follower of Ali Muhammad. Ma'rifa of the Imam is number one is crucial. Number two, the Holy Sixth Imam says, Whomsoever, man sarra an yakuna min ashab al qa'im. If you want to be of the people, of the followers of the awaited Savior, fal yantadir, let them wait. Doing what? Wal ya'mal bil wara'. Let them practice God consciousness. Be fearful of Allah. Somebody, one of the scholars once told me, every time you sit on the member or stand in the podium, have this complete recognition that the Imam is sitting in the audience. Imagine if you and I undertake our daily tasks every single day, knowing that the Imam is watching us, knowing that the Imam is aware of our activities. Would we become or practice taqwa and wara or not? Are we embarrassed that the Imam would see whatever we do in our daily lives or not? The second point is for you and I to display and to demonstrate this God consciousness and the fear of Allah. And importantly, very crucially, if we want to have a close affinity with the Imam, then there are a number of idols that exist in our hearts. Brothers and sisters, we need to crush. We need to begin to break one after the other. Let me give you a very quick story. There was an individual whose father was a scholar in a village in northern Iran. This individual who had the blessing of being the son of a scholar, his father died and he passed away. They came to him and said, surely your father is knowledgeable and automatically you would be as well. You're his son, right? So they placed the turban on his head. He was excited, you know. It feels nice. So he sat down on the member. They started asking him questions. He started reciting some sermons. He felt good about himself. One day, somebody asked him a basic, thick, jurisprudential question. He had no answer. He had no background as far as Islamic education. What happened was, at that moment, there was an idol in his heart. The idol was what? The idol was either arrogance or self-centeredness of the love of oneself or ego. He crushed it. He came in front of the people, in front of the community and said, you know what? From today, I'm no longer your scholar. I'm going to go and start from scratch. He took off his turban, went to the holy city of Qom, went to a mujtahid. The mujtahid today says, he came to me, he said, teach me from scratch. I want to know everything about Islam from the beginning. He said, I started to teach him. After several years, I began to notice that he had knowledge which I had not given him knowledge which was outstanding knowledge that I had not come across I began to acknowledge that he had connections and conversations with another human being who was sublime in his understanding of Allah and I came to him and I said so and so please when you have a conversation with that man remember me also I want to have that pleasure of meeting this individual. Later on, one day when I was sitting with him in a lesson, he said to me, he said to me, do you know what, O oh Sheikh? The Imam says, break your idols and I will come and seek you. You don't need to look for me. 
I will come and look for you. I will be your companion and I will meet you. But importantly, make that active, determined, conscious decision to examine your soul and to become an individual whom the Imam is indeed pleased with. But the second element, so that's a basic look at our responsibilities individually. But what I want to focus the, the rest of the discussion is about the second element, which is community level, community service, offering a kind of work to help the lives of others. You see, brothers and sisters, when it comes to the religion of Islam, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran addresses the community. Very rarely Allah addresses human beings individually, except if they are prophets. But Allah says, Ya ayyuhalladheena amanu, you and I each day in salah we recite Surah Al-Hamd, Iyaka, we're speaking to Allah, but as if we're talking to Him collectively, to you, unto you we worship. Iyaka na'budu wa iyaka nasta'een. The Prophet of Allah, Muhammad al Mustafa, sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. When he came to Medina, had two important roles. Number one, to establish religion and deen. But secondly, what did he do? He caused this brotherhood to be established amongst the Ansar and the Muhajireen. But at the same time, he built the masjid. Why? Because it's the hub for community work. It's the hub for community service. You know, you and I have heard this particular narration that the Prophet of Allah says, Shayyabatni Surat Hud. Surat Hud, the chapter of Prophet Hud, has made me go gray. In other words, there is a verse in Surat Hud that is indeed quite stressful and is very, very difficult. Normally what you hear from the scholars is, this, this verse is, Fastaqim Kama Umert, right? The verse says, be upright, just like how you were commanded to. But the problem is, there is another verse in Surah Shura that says exactly the same thing. فَاسْتَقِمْ كَمَا أُمِرْتْ Why is it then in Surah Hud, we are told that the Prophet of Allah says it was a heavy burden. It was something that was very, very difficult. Was it just this or was it the completion of the verse? The completion of the verse and please pay attention to this because Islam is not a religion of individualism. Islam is a religion for the community, for the betterment of society, for all. It's not about being an individual who's a hermit or practices monasticism and goes and confines themselves in the cave. Islam is about being an active member in the community. And that's why the Quran says in Surah Hud, فَاسْتَقِمْ كَمَا أُمِرْتْ What? وَمَنْ تَابَ معك. And also the people who are with you. In other words, what? In other words, Allah wa ta'ala says, it's about nourishing that healthy, that strong building of the community that is crucial and essential. The Prophet of Allah is told, be upright as well as those who are with you, as well as those who submit with you. Now the question is, how do we prepare the community collectively for the arrival of the Imam? How do we prepare ourselves all together? The Holy Sixth Imam, Imam Ja'far ibn Muhammad al Sadiq, salawatullahi wa salamu alayhi, was asked, Ya ibn Rasulillah, what is my responsibility as far as the community is concerned? Imam alayhi salam responds to one of his companions and says, the most important thing for you to recognize is that others have rights upon you. There are 70 rights, Imam alayhi salam says, that others or that at least the believers have upon each other. 70, seven zero. So one of his companions said to him, Ya ibn Rasulillah, can you tell me, can you start telling me these 70 rights? Because I'm interested, I want to know. Imam alayhi salam beautifully says to him, Inni alayka shafiq. You know, I'm compassionate over you. I don't really want to tell you. Why? Do you know why the Imam tells him I don't want to tell you? Bi akhafu an ta'lam wa la ta'mal. I'm afraid that I give you knowledge and you do not act upon it. Because if you have knowledge and you do not act upon it, Allah says, Lima taquluna ma la taf'aloon. Kabura maqtan indallahi an taqulu ma la taf'aloon. Some people are there seeking knowledge and they want to better themselves. But the knowledge that is not utilized for the services of mankind and human beings is knowledge that is considered useless. And that's why the Imam says, I am afraid for you. But this individual, the companion Ibn Khunayz of the Imam, 
was quite ecstatic. He was an individual who said to the oh, Imam, Ya ibn Rasulullah, now tell me, I want to know, tell me. Look at what the Imam says, 70 rights? He says, I'll give you one. The first thing he says, أَيْسَرُ حَقٍ مِنْهَا أَن تُحِبُّ لِأَخِيكَ مَا تُحِبُّ لِنَفْسِكَ The basic level of these 70 rights in the community when it comes to the rights of others over yourself is to love for your brother or sister what you love for yourself. Allahu Akbar. What the rest of the 69 are, I don't want to think about. This, the first level is for you to love for others what you love for yourself. Imam alayhi salam in another occasion says to him, look at how the Imam wants to break this egoistic feeling and this selfishness. He wants you and I to become active individuals who serve others. Why? Because the Ahl al-Bayt did this. The Ahl al-Bayt were the manifestations of altruism and sacrifice. You've all heard of the story where somebody came to the Holy Prophet and said, Ya Rasulullah, I'm hungry and I need to be clothed. Is there any food or are there any clothes? Rasulullah sends a message to his wives, nothing comes back or they say we do not have anything. The only individual in the mosque that stands up is none other than Imam Al-Muttaqeen wa Amir Al-Mu'mineen Ali ibn Abi Talib Salamallahu Alayhi He says to him, Ya, ya, uh, ya Rasulullah, I'll take him. He takes him home. When he takes him home, Sayyida Fatima is not aware of this individual coming home. Amir al-Mu'mineen says, we have a guest. They have food for one person and therefore Ali, Fatima, Hassan and Hussein notice. They have food only for one person. Fatima says, we'll give it to this man. But he will be expecting you, O Abu al-Hassan, to eat also. Imam says, the first thing that we will do is we'll put the kids to sleep. Secondly, we will switch off the lights so that he will not look at my face. He will not realize and recognize that I'm not eating with him. So that all the food is for him. Look at the spirit of altruism. The man eats. In the morning, Rasulullah says, Ya Ali, what did you do yesterday? Amir al muminin said, this is what happened. The Holy Prophet says, Ya Ali, there is a verse that's been revealed in the Holy Quran, chapter 59, verse 9. Allah says, وَيُؤْثِرُونَ عَلَىٰ أَنفُسِهِمْ وَلَوْ كَانَ بِهِمْ خَصَاصَةً They prefer others over themselves, even though they needed it most. And Allah revealed this on the merit of altruism and sacrifice, and we all know what happened, and the story that is described in Surah Al-Insan. Yet the idea that emerges here is the feeling of preferring others over oneself. And then in another occasion, the holy Imam says, Ma amana billah. And this is a chilling narration, brothers and sisters. Pay attention to this. The Imam, salamullahi alayhi, the sixth Imam says, Ma amana billah wa rasulihi wa la bi Ali. Nobody believes in Allah, his messenger, neither Ali, who does what? Men إِذَا أَتَاهُ أَخُوهُ الْمُؤْمِنِ If your believing brother and sister, أَخَاهُ in Arabic could be referring to either a male or a female. If a male or a female from your brothers and sisters come to you with a need, this issue of قَضَاء حَاجَةُ الْمُؤْمِنِ Fulfilling the needs of others. If somebody comes to you, Imam alayhi salam says, لَمْ يَضْحَكْ فِي وَجْهِهِ Allahu Akbar. Imam says, if the man or woman comes to you and seeks something, he knows or she knows that you can fulfill a hajjah. Imam says the first thing is if you do not smile in their face. Just smiling to start off with. Even though you may not be able to do it. You know there are less muscles used to smile than to frown. Right? It's a very simple thing to do. The Prophet of Islam says, al tabassum sadaqa. That when you smile, it's a form of charity. The Holy Eighth Imam says, Al Tabassumu Hasana. When it comes to Hasanat, you know, if you want to pick up loads and loads of Hasanat, then smile. I can see people smile a lot now and maybe later. The idea being is that the Prophet and, and the Quran and the religion of Islam is the religion of morality. It wants to establish this well being in the community and it presents this idea of the need to smile. When somebody comes to you, you know, sometimes we're in a mind of our own and we're quite stressful and somebody comes to us and wants something from us. No, I'm sorry, I don't have it. I'm too busy. Smile, the Prophet of, uh, or the Imam alayhi salam says. And then he says, لَمْ يَفْحَكْ فِي وَجْهِهِ فَإِذَا كَانَتْ حَاجَتُهُ عِنْدَهِ سَارَعَ إِلَىٰ قَضَائِهِ If the hajar is there, he or she does not hesitate for a moment to fulfill it. And then the Imam says, remember, whoever doesn't do this, the Imam says, cannot be considered an individual who believes in Allah, the Prophet, or the Ahl al-Bayt. And then he says, but if he doesn't have the uh, capability to fulfill the hajjah, then he seeks to help 
his brother and sister in finding someone who does in assisting them in that particular manner the idea that therefore emerges is the need to understand brothers and sisters that in order for us to become a community that is ready for the arrival and for the reappearance of the Imam Sharif, we need to be thinking about the services to others. Many people ask, people like myself, they ask the following. They say, how do we get close to Allah? What is the prescription to spirituality? Brothers and sisters, mark my words. Spirituality, connection to Allah, proximity to the Almighty is not about Salah and Psalm only. It starts with service to humanity. Look at this narration. You might say to me, what? I want to go and pray. I want to go tasbih. I want to... All these are essential and important. But community work, service work, all strengthen the heart. Individuals who have sought this path have indeed said that without it, you will not be able to achieve success in this world as far as spiritual position and status is concerned. Why? Because the narration says, أَقْرَبُ مَا يَكُونُ الْعَبْدُ إِلَى اللَّهِ إِذَا أَدْخَلَ عَلَى قُلُوبِ الْمُؤْمِنِ سُرُورًا the best position that an individual can be in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is if they place happiness and joy in the hearts of their believing brother and sister. Imagine, this is what we're talking about. This is the community. Let me conclude by asking you a question. If today you have the opportunity to meet the Holy Twelfth Imam, he was there. At the same time, a brother or sister came to you and wanted some help with something. Which would you choose? Which would you choose? Ask yourself this question. You don't need to reply. Which would you take? Because I have an answer for you from the sixth Imam. Aban ibn Taghlib, he was performing the tawaf and all of a sudden he saw the Imam next to him. He became so ecstatic. He came right next to the Imam. You know, sometimes in tawaf, we are doing this tawaf and then we see an alim, we say, fantastic, I'll go next to the alim. Maybe the tawaf will be accepted. So this man, Aban, was a great scholar. He goes and sits and stands next to the Imam. What an honor to be next to the Imam of the time in tawaf, in circumambulation, remembering Allah. At that moment, somebody calls, Aban, Aban. This man doesn't pay attention. Next round, this man who's standing calls, Aban, Aban. Imam Ali salam looks at him and says, Aban, why don't you answer him? Aban says, Ya ibn Rasulullah, I have the honor of being with you in tawaf. Imam says, and so? And this time, Aban wants to become, you know, an expert. He says, but it's wajib tawaf. I can't leave it. If I leave it, it will become batal. He's teaching the Imam. He's teaching, he's telling the Imam, if I leave it, it will become batal. Imam says, when? And so, he's calling you. And then he says, let me tell you, there are 70 rights for the believer. And one of the rights is what they call you, you answer them. This is the call that we need to take. The question today is, brothers and sisters, as we conclude, there is a great deal of apathy when it comes to community work. There is a great deal of reluctantness. People are lazy. People say, who cares? It's not my concern. It's not my problem. If today each and every one of us utilizes our own skills, utilizes our own abilities to fulfill the mission of Allah and the mission of the Prophet and the Imam alayhi salam, to serve humanity, to better the lives of others, each and every one of us can do something something in their own way. Each and every human being has a talent that we can utilize. You know, we recite this particular narration, Mata tarana wa narak. We speak to the Imam, oh Imam, when is it that we're gonna see you and you will see us? The question is, Imam is waiting for us. We are not waiting for the Imam. The idea that we have to inculcate in our existence, in our minds, in our thoughts, is to be active in community, is to seek each and every opportunity that exists. That's one of the best ways in which we can be called the followers of the Imam and prepare our communities for the eventual arrival and to become of the community of the Holy Imam I pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to enlighten our hearts with the ma'rifah of Imam al-Zaman and I pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us the strength to recognize our duties and responsibilities collectively as a community in the preparation for the eventual reappearance. وآخر دعوانا أن الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلي اللهم على محمد وآله الطاهرين.